This is CBC Here and Now. You are looking at some much larger space here at the Dr. H. Bliss Murphy Cancer Center, and it's important because this is where a new chemotherapy treatment center is going to be built, and the statistics indicate that you or somebody you know is going to be treated here. Some special coverage tonight on Here and Now, but first, here's Debbie with today's top news stories. Thanks so much, Anthony, and we will see you a little bit later. We start tonight with reaction to a planned investigation into the province's marijuana industry. The Auditor General confirmed yesterday she'll be looking into the players and policy of legal weed in this province. It will be a broad review of the overall industry, including that controversial $40 million canopy growth contract. Here now is Katie Breen is in our newsroom tonight. Katie. That's right. I spoke with leaders of all three political parties today. They want to see this investigation happen. Of course, there's some suspicion in the cannabis industry here in the province. Accusations that friends of the Liberal Party are benefiting from legalization. Today, leaders said that this AG investigation should clarify things and therefore they're happy she's chosen to investigate the industry. I'm really pleased by it. I, I think that this is a good a activity and a good exercise in transparency and it's going to answer a lot of questions we had about the awarding of the tax breaks and about awarding of the contracts. The question is, has there been uh, discrimination or favoritism in the awarding of licenses and has there been discrimination or favoritism in the awarding of substantial public monies like the $40 million to Canopy Growth? And uh, those are important issues about fairness and how the government conducts public business. No, she's not going to find anything. Uh, this, listen, I'm excited about this because simply it will clarify, not coming from a politician, but it will clarify from one of some of the best offices that we have in this province. So this is why you know, I'm happy to hear that the AG is coming in to dig into this program because it will clarify this misinformation that's been out there now for quite some time. Now, the AG won't just look into the selection process for cannabis companies here in the province. She's most interested in the public policy side of things, but she will be looking into selection, regulations, and whether or not businesses are complying with their contracts. Now, a pot shop owner in Labrador West, for one, he thinks that this investigation is a great idea. I think something like that would be necessary to make sure things are run smoothing, but maybe to see what other bumps are still in the road that could be smoothened out. Uh, to make the, our operations run a lot smoother. So there is room for improvement, so it's good that uh, they're going to do that investigation. Now, the Auditor General hasn't said when she will do her investigation, but she has committed to doing one. Live in the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. The leaders of a local union are facing allegations of misspending their members' money. Top officials with the Electricians Union have stepped in and suspended officers of IBEW Local 2330. Last summer, members protested outside the union locals' offices. They said union leaders were holding back financial information and details surrounding work agreements. Now, officers with IBEW 2330 are facing allegations that they misused union money. Union letters sent to CBC News detail those allegations. A hearing will be held on June 24th to determine if a further investigation is warranted. The officers are accused of improperly approving pay raises for employees, paying unauthorized severances to ex-employees, and paying an inordinate amount of money for taxis for the local union president, in addition to giving her an automobile allowance. Well, it is unnerving, knives, broken glass, even nails sticking out of garbage bags. It's a worry for every garbage collector in the province. Well, tonight, the town of Conception Bay South is begging people to be more cautious about what they stuff into their garbage bags. As here now's Carolyn Stokes reports, the plea comes after workers are finding some very dangerous items at the end of driveways. Well, it can be grueling work lifting and heaving people's garbage into trucks. But for the collectors, it's not just the physical labor that can be painful. They also have to keep an eye open for hidden dangers. 
sharp objects, shards of glass, a rusty saw, protruding nails. These are just a few of the hazards garbage collectors encounter all too often. Well, unfortunately, you know, we've seen everything from broken knives, glass sticking out of bags. We actually had a, an employee punctured a while ago with a needle, for example. There was months of uh, tests and so on that had to go through. And I guess the worry and torment, too, obviously, for someone who's, who's in that business and, and their families. You know, there's some extremely dangerous objects that we can put in our garbage that can really do some serious damage to people who, who look after us every single day. 17 garbage collectors have been injured since 2013, and last year alone, the town spent a quarter of a million dollars in lost time. And this is one solution. Right now, about half of CBS has automated garbage collection, and the plan is for everyone to have it by this fall. But until then... Very important to, to package appropriately. And things like glass, you put it in a cardboard box, you tape it up properly, and you label it. And labeling is the biggest thing. And the mayor says boxing up those sharp objects is good practice even if you have automated garbage because those dangerous items can still fall out of the garbage bag before making it to the landfill. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, CBS. So it's certainly a day for the ducks for parts of uh, the island today. Very different from what we saw yesterday with all that sunshine, especially for eastern Newfoundland and the Avalon. Uh, temperatures a little cooler as well, only reaching 13 degrees in St. John's. We've got those uh, high teens, though, for most of the island and up through Labrador. Happy Valley Goose Bay currently sitting at 14 degrees. Now I mentioned all of that rain moving in. We saw that cloud cover spread across the island today. That rain moving right along with it. It's going to be heavy at times as we head through the overnight for certain areas. I'll tell you how much rain we're expecting and what the forecast looks like towards the weekend when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. High water levels on the Churchill River brought a flood alert to Mud Lake and lower parts of Happy Valley Goose Bay this year. It has also dredged up old fears about a repeat of 2017 when flooding forced the evacuation of Mud Lake by helicopter and caused massive damage to homes and properties. And now they want to see something done to stop it from happening again. Here now's Jacob Barker has that story. I got in my argle. John Chason has an escape hatch now, just in case. If it ever comes out that uh, it floods, well, I got to just haul my Argo in and then jump in Argo and then I'll, I'll untie her and go on because, I mean, I got her all ready to go there. She's ready to start and everything, and I'm gone with her. She floats in water, so I'm good. It didn't flood this year, but it was close. River levels rose high enough to bring flood warnings for Mud Lake and Mud Lake Road, and Chason says there might be a good way to stop that. We need uh, this river dredge to take the sandbars, because the sandbars is building up, and this is what our problem is. Our problem is that the, the ice, is, whether it gets hard, it comes and it blocks our river, and that's the sandbar that's doing that. Well, Mud Lake is just across the river from here, and in the summer, the only way in and out is by boat. And the people that have been doing this trip for years and years say that sand in the channel here just keeps building up, and they say that's increasing the flood risk. It's, uh, it's been a concern, I think, over the years that uh, the channels have got, uh, you know, sh more shallow each year. An independent assessment done in the wake of the 2017 flood recommended exploring the idea of dredging the lower river as a possible mitigation measure. Yes, it, uh, it'll cost money, but if they can do a project for $13 million, they can dredge two channels to provide comfort and safety to the people of the Upper Lake Melville area and just as important to the residents in Mud Lake. Anderson says he's heard people say for the past few years their motorboats have been dragging on the bottom of the river for the first time ever. Look, people who lived here all their lives are saying that these two channels need to be dredged. And you can go and do studies all you want to. You can hire someone from, from the mainland to come and do a study. But I mean, a bit of common sense. And here, I think dredging is common sense. Residents and the mayor continue to push for the idea, but the province says it's not considering any dredging of the Churchill River. Jacob Barker, CBC News, on Mud Lake Road.
Commemorations in France today of the bravery and sacrifice by Allied soldiers during the Second World War. This is the 75th anniversary of D-Day, a day that helped change the world for the better. On June 6, 1944, Allied soldiers fought their way ashore in Normandy against the power of Nazi Germany. Later on here and now, we'll take a closer look at today's events in France. Right now, we'll meet a Second World War vet living in this province, Roderick Dion. He explains what it was like to serve in the Second World War on D-Day. This next piece was put together as a co-production between CBC Kids News and The National. My name is Claire Donnan, I'm 15 years old, and today I met with Mr. Roderick Joseph Dion to ask him what it was truly like serving in the Navy on D-Day during World War II. Well, it was a very, very windy day, a typical day like you have it over then. <laughs> windy and rainy, <laughs> and it was very raw. So the two combined, it's not easy. There's, if I remember right, 6,000 vessels that took part in D-Day. And there was so many airplanes up there flying over our head. What was the scariest part of being there on D-Day? Those big German guns firing up to 40 miles. And they kept firing at us, and you see the smoke, and then you see the shell hit the water around us. There was shells all over the place. It's like a thunderstorm. You stand by so something happened, and you get ready to do whatever you have to do if it happens. This is Carl Smith, and this is Gary Smith, and both of these gentlemen want the entire province to be in this together and build a new chemotherapy unit here in St. John's. That story's coming up.
Welcome back, everyone. Of course, Ashley, before we get to the weather, we just have to show everybody this bit of video. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a scene that played out uh, supper time yesterday on the highway to Conception Bay South. Four lanes of highway were closed, and yes, that's a police officer that you see in the ditch. <laughs> he looks to be waving something up onto the road. It was a family of ducks, and they were stuck in the median. Yeah, oh, gosh. So uh, everybody obviously had to stop. Many were applauding uh, Constable RNC Constable Glenn Cunningham for escorting those little ones across. They even blew their horns as uh, applause for him doing that. <laughs> thanking him. Isn't that sweet? So sweet. Oh, I love when I see stories like that. Now, speaking of ducks, you did say earlier it was weather for ducks today yes. in many parts. It really did come pounding down, but it wasn't all that cold. No, it wasn't yeah. terrible as far as temperatures go. No. Uh, a little cooler than what we saw yesterday here in St. John's. We'll take a look at those temperatures. Uh, 13 degrees was the afternoon high, but uh, a number of high teens across the island. A little cooler again for the south coast, and we can thank that southerly flow for that. And then that's also kind of why we're seeing this rain right now. And uh, those temperatures have cooled a little bit now that that rain is starting to push a little bit further north, down to about 11 degrees in Gander, 13 in Cornerbrook. Happy Valley Goose Bay still sitting at 12 degrees. So we'll take a look at the satellite radar. We saw all that cloud cover push through earlier today. A little bit of peaks of sun this morning along the northeast coast, but all that rain has uh, made an appearance and it's going to stick around as we head through the overnight tonight. We can see that future tracker bring those periods of rain or seeing that period, those periods of rain continue to spread uh, at least for central and eastern Newfoundland and then the south coast as well. Now yesterday, we talked about how uh, the most precipitation will be for the south coast. That's moved a little bit further east with the uh, newest model run. So somewhere between 20 to 40 millimeters of rain is possible for uh, the Canagra Peninsula. Could see upwards of about 50 millimeters in uh, locally. Otherwise, we're looking at about 10 to 20 millimeters through the overnight. This brings us through to uh, tomorrow afternoon. Slight chance of some showers as well up through uh, the northern peninsula, but essentially the Bayford Peninsula and then down uh, towards the west coast, anything north of the port of port really is only looking at that potential for a few showers into the evening hours tonight. So those temperatures sitting uh, around 7 degrees, 11 in St. John's with uh, some southwesterly still a little gusty, six, 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. Port of Basque looking at 7, Marystown 10 and St. Anthony 6 degrees tonight. Now uh, Lab City, Lab West anyway, still looking at that risk of some wet flurries through tonight. And then everywhere else, we're looking at that shower activity. Happy Valley Goose Bay going down to four degrees. Nain, one with generally light winds through the overnight. So this takes us through to, uh, to uh, Friday. We're going to see uh, some sunshine through the afternoon once we get all those showers out of the way, especially for the eastern portion of the island. Generally looking at that shower, those showers in the morning and then they should stay quite, it should stay quite cloudy rather. And then we're looking at uh, unsettled weather up through Labrador again through the day on Friday. So here's your temperature still a little bit warmer than today. So 16 degrees for St. John's hitting, uh, heading towards central Grand Falls winter 22 Cornerbrook still in those uh, high or mid teens rather 15 degrees and St. Anthony at 12 up through Happy Valley Goose Bay looks like a high near 16 degrees for you tomorrow seven for Lab City again that chance of flurries in the morning and then eventually that will change over to rain. So if we head into Saturday we're going to go a little bit further ahead we've just got a little disturbance moving through with that we could see some showers spreading across the island as long with some cloud cover likely will not be a washout through the day it does look quite nice and those temperatures are going to recover as well so 16 to 17 degrees Corner Brook 13 same for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Lab City is finally going to see those double digit temperatures return as well. So we'll just take a look quickly at the next five days. There's your double digit temperatures mid teens through Saturday. Sunday looks like we'll see uh, some more cloud cover and showers for St. John's for sure. And then uh, eventually Tuesdays when that sunshine will return really Monday evening and then into Tuesday. So central Newfoundland 22 beautiful degrees tomorrow with plenty of sunshine. Saturday that chance of showers will move through. Sunday looks more wet and then the return of that sunshine for Monday and Tuesday. Western Newfoundland uh, between 13 and 15 degrees for this weekend. By the time we get to next week, sunshine and uh, high teens it looks like through the day. And then Eastern Labrador 
You're looking at teen temperatures as well. Monday, Tuesday, certainly the best out of the next five days with that plenty of sunshine. And then for Western Labrador, we're looking at seven degrees tomorrow. Again, with that potential for a few flurries in the morning, showers for Saturday, and then Sunday and Monday look lovely with those temperatures in the mid-teens. So let's look at your forecast. We'll have your weather photo coming up later in the show. Now we are going to have more of that fantastic video a bit later in here and now, so that's just a taste to make sure that you're going to hang on for this important story that we're covering with some special coverage on tonight's program. And I want to introduce you to our next two guests now to explain just why we are here in this large space. And perhaps uh, it makes sense to start with, uh, with you, Gary. So where are we? So we're on the Health Sciences Complex at the site of the brand new chemotherapy unit for the Dr. H. Bliss Murphy Cancer Care Center. And one of the things that struck out to, stuck out to me when we prepared for this was we used to say it was one in three people would be affected by cancer. Now it's one in two? That's absolutely right. In the next five to ten years, the diagnosis of cancer right across Canada are going to increase. And here at Newfoundland and Labrador, it will be a 40% increase. So that means one in two people sometime in your life will come down with cancer in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And that's an amazing statistic, but it actually goes beyond that because we all know when someone that you know and love gets cancer, everybody gets involved. So this will really affect everybody in the province is increasing the diagnosis of cancer. And the space that we have here is going to be a tremendous launch for us to improve our facility. Currently our space for chemotherapy is downstairs here at the complex and it was built 30 years ago and it served us tremendously well. The doctors, the nurses, the people who care for our patients have done a fabulous job. But we need to get to a new space because this increase in number, we just will not be able to work it downstairs. All right, now you're with the foundation and you're with the campaign. So Carl, uh, tell me about this. What, what do you want to see happen? Where are things now and where do you want things to go? Yes, so the current facility, as Gary pointed out, is about 3,500 square feet. As you can see from this shot, we're in a space now that will be about 10,000 square feet, which will make a huge difference, obviously. The price tag, we estimate, is $6.5 million. Uh, the provincial government has been very, very good to us, and they'll contribute about $1.5 million, primarily for a new pharmacy. Currently, there is not a pharmacy in the chemotherapy unit downstairs. There will be one here. Okay, so that means there's $5 million left to go to pay for, right? There is $5 million left to go. We started the campaign earlier this year, and I'm happy to say that we've met with tremendous success already. We have, uh, we're currently over halfway there. We had a large, large contribution from the Hebron Employers Association, so we really want to thank them for kicking off the campaign. And the corporate community and the business community has really come on side as well. So we're hopeful that by the end of this year, we'll have the funds in place and we can just get started building. All right, and you can obviously go to websites and in this together and check that out. Going to wrap things up quickly, but for people who are watching here and now, it's not just big businesses and corporations. I guess every dollar counts or something like this. What do you want people to do? Every single dollar counts, Anthony. There's no question about it. And there is a, a, a web presence. It's called inthistogethernl.ca, and $5, $50, every single dollar will help. All right, Carl. And Anthony, maybe just to add to that too, mm -hmm. right? We really got to stress the point that the communities across the province, we want your involvement. Every single community in Newfoundland and Labrador can give us a hand with this with your community groups. And then there's the companies in the province through your employees and your customers. Try to find ways to inspire the people in the province to give to this wonderful campaign. All right, gentlemen, thank you both very, very much. Appreciate thank that. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, now stay tuned because we have more on this story because coming up, we're going to actually talk a bit about that video and why musicians and singers, why they care so much about cancer in our province. Stay tuned. He's no trouble, he's no, and God love him, it's good. But I mean, I deserve a weekend, huh? They love their jobs, but they need a break. Next, why these caregivers are calling for changes to the program.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Two caregivers in Cornerbrook say they are at a breaking point. They say the provincial system for taking care of adults with disabilities is broken too. Lindsay Bird reports. Oh, I'm all spotty. Bradley Flynn shoots pool every day with his two caregivers, Brenda and Gerard Kennedy. Oh, Flynn is I'm almost 60, spotty. upbeat and active. The Kennedys are paid to take care of Flynn through a home care program for adults with intellectual disabilities. The three all get along, but Flynn keeps the Kennedys on their toes, and the couple say time off is very rare. You need a break. He's no trouble. He's no, and God love him, it's good. But I mean, I deserves a week and a half. The Kennedys say they've had about 12 days off in almost two years of taking care of Flynn. The program's fine print says the couple are entitled to 54 days a year off, but every time the Kennedys ask for holidays, they say they're denied, told there's nowhere else for Flynn to go. The Kennedys don't want to be compensated for the missed time, but they do want a little relief. It's not about the money. It's about getting a break. And you turn on the radio every day, it's all about mental health, mental health. What about the caregivers mental health that's taking care of these people? Obviously, the government don't care. The Kennedys say another couple offered to take Flynn for overnight stays, but the program's home licensing rules drowned those efforts in red tape. The Kennedys think the bureaucracy needs to loosen up to let adults with disabilities stay in more people's homes instead of being institutionalized or causing caregiver stress. Something's got to give. How do they expect people to look after people like Bradley if they're not going to help? You know, it's like the government puts them in your home and tough titty, you're stuck. Western Health administers the program here in Western Newfoundland a program that hasn't been updated since 2007. The health authority refused to comment on the Kennedy situation, citing privacy concerns. Lindsay Bird, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Tributes and respects were paid to the fallen on France's Normandy coast today, all to mark the 75th anniversary of D-Day. On June 6, 1944, a surprise sea and air operation turned the tide of the Second World War. Tens of thousands of Allied troops took part, including 14,000 Canadians. CBC's Thomas Dagla was there for today's ceremonies. Today's Canadian D-Day commemorations put veterans from the Battle of Normandy front and centre. Not only did they sit up front and hear their bravery honoured, but the most poignant moment of the day may have come at the end of the ceremony when they were invited to return to the beaches, Juneau Beach, where Canadians landed 75 years ago today. In some cases, these veterans had not been back to that beach for 75 years. On the battlefields of Normandy, Francophones, Anglophones, Indigenous peoples, new Canadians came together as one. Thousands of Canadians made the trip over to France to be here for today's commemorations. Uh, everyone seemed to have a story, a personal connection to the Battle of Normandy or indeed the Second World War and they were eager to share those stories today. My grandfather, uh, he survived uh, D-Day and he survived throughout the war and he came back to Canada. He was able to come here 10 years ago for the 65th anniversary and it was an incredibly emotional experience for him to be back because it was the first time he was back since the war. And uh, he passed away last year so I got asked to attend on his behalf uh, to, to honour his memory. My dad never spoke of the war, he never said a word so never really knew much about it but coming here makes you understand what they went through. Commemorations continued well into the evening here at Juneau Beach at an international ceremony where representatives from every country involved in the Battle of Normandy, including Canada, Britain, the United States, and Germany, they all laid wreaths on the beach where each one of those countries fought many years ago. This could be the last time that so many Battle of Normandy veterans returned to France for commemorations. And as someone in the crowd said today, 75 years ago, they had no fear. Today, their only fear is that what happened here is forgotten. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, 
at Juno Beach. Newfoundland's own Anna Sisters marked today's 75th anniversary with an emotional performance from Juno Beach. The sisters are calling it the highlight of their career. We return now to Normandy, France. Welcome back to Here and Now. Tonight, you've been hearing about the In This Together campaign. It's a fundraiser to raise $5 million for a new chemotherapy unit for the Dr. H. Bliss Murphy Cancer Center, and it's already halfway to its goal. Anthony is live at the site of that new center tonight, and we'll check back with him in just a few minutes. But first, let's take a look at the staggering statistics in our province. 
In Newfoundland and Labrador, 11 people are diagnosed with cancer every single day. That means in their lifetime, one in two people in this province will be told they have cancer. So what are the most common cancers in this province? For men, prostate cancer is most prevalent, followed by colorectal and then lung cancer. For women in this province, breast cancer is most common, followed by lung cancer and then colorectal cancer. And here's what else we know. With our growing and aging population, the number of cancer cases in the province is rising each year. We also know that Newfoundland and Labrador has the highest rates in the country when it comes to smoking, alcohol consumption, and obesity. The good news? Half of all cancers can be prevented with a healthy lifestyle, and that's through eating well, of course, proper exercise, and regular screenings from your doctor. So after that update on the statistics in the province, Anthony is rejoining us now and he's standing by at the soon to be chemotherapy unit at the Health Sciences Center with a guest. Anthony? All right, Debbie, appreciate that. And uh, if you're listening to Debbie and watching that sort of statistical unfolding of how serious cancer can be for so many of us, it explains what we're doing here tonight in this important we're in this together campaign that we've been talking about on Here and Now. Kelly Walsh, no stranger to uh, Here and Now, no stranger to CBC writ large in Newfoundland Labrador. Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, thank you to all of you as well. There's so many, and they're so be are they always as well behaved? Absolutely. <laughs> Better be. Um, so listen, we're going to talk about this video. You were sort of, uh, mastermind is too strong, but you wanted to bring people from the arts community uh, to actually get involved in this. Can you tell me a bit about that? Well, I think, you know, this song, this video, this project really talks to, you know, who we are as a people. We talk about culture a lot in the province, and culture, it's not a song or a dance or a play. Culture is how we live our everyday lives. It's how we want the world to see us. And art and song and music, that's just a, it's a manifestation of culture. And so this song is, you know, it's kind of the foundation of who we are as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. From as long as we remember, we have stories of how we have had to come together. We've had to build community to do hard things, to thrive, to, to grow, and, uh, and to make life here wonderful for everybody here so this song one voice is about how we come together to make our place a better place and uh, we had over 500 incredible musicians come together and give their time with the amazing CBC crew to show you know to inspire people to action that when we come together you know people can be inspired to do incredible things and this is you know this is what we all need to do now Okay, well, certainly it was a lot of work, uh, most of it all on your part and the, music, and the musicians and certainly the CBC crew as well, but I think we'll give most of you the credit for this. This really is quite something. Have a look. In 2015, I lost my voice and I sing a lot in choir and with my band. Um, I didn't realize why I was losing my voice. I wasn't sick. So I went to my ENT. Uh, they transferred me to an oncologist and let me know that I needed a partial thyroid removal because uh, there was a tumor that was pressing on my vocal cords. I just thought I had a lump on my neck and was wondering why my neck was so thick. I uh, I couldn't get my necklace on. It bothered me. Uh, and uh, then my surgeon, or my yeah, ENT, told me that I had uh, thyroid cancer. Mary Sung uh, moved to Newfoundland from Burma. She was a new immigrant to Canada, came here without any family. I was really scared. I was really sad and frustrated. Uh, music has always been a huge part of my life. I sing all day, every day. Uh, so not being able to sing was really a scary moment for me and very frustrating and I didn't know if I would ever get my voice back. It was uh, chilling and you realize that you are the one that has cancer. How, how could this be? I was healthy seconds ago. Well, she was 17 years old. She began school at Holy Heart High School and uh, she was introduced to me. Uh, she couldn't speak very, well, very good English but she loved to sing. When I did get my uh, surgery, they actually paralyzed my left vocal nerve, so I didn't know if I would ever sing again. I had to process it. I had to figure out what I was going to do with my children. Um, and I had to come to terms quickly with the fact that as a singer, um, with this type of surgery, I potentially would never, could never speak or sing again. The cancer had come back. She had, she had, had previously been diagnosed while living in Burma. 
cancer had returned. With proper training and time and recovery, I did start and support from my family and uh, choir friends. I did, in fact, start to sing again, and I'm very happy that I can do that now. When the doctor went in and, and had a look, it was in bad shape. Um, but thankfully, he was very skilled and very compassionate and uh, spent a lot of time on, on the nerve. Uh, uh, that was full, that was filled with cancer, and, and uh, I was I was spared. At that point in time, I had a very small group of girls, um, a choral a choral music class. Um, there was just twelve girls in the class, and uh, so she joined it, that that group. And we, you know, we met every day. We learned songs together. We focused on Newfoundland music, actually, a, a, a fair amount, which was great for her because she was starting to learn our culture. Um, unfortunately. By Christmas of that year, she started to, uh, her disease started to get worse and her cancer became more aggressive and treatments unfortunately stopped working. Mary was surrounded by friends who shared one really common bond and that was the power of music. We all, we all had someone close to us. Um, with cancer, some are, are merciful, some are savage. Like anyone in the world, I guess cancer is, is affecting every family. And, uh, you know, I guess my family is no different. Uh, I've had you know, grandparents and aunts and an uncle who, uh, who've had cancer and most recently in the past two years um, I lost my mom to, uh, to cancer. It's wonderful for a community to band together and, uh, and to connect and sing and heal when I first was diagnosed, my voice was gone. And now that I have had um, a year to recover from my surgeries, I'm actually singing in this beautiful campaign about how cancer has affected musicians. And the fact that I can do this, surrounded by my friends um, and family in my choir, is really emotional for me, and I love that I can do that. I truly, I know that it's a different voice. I have the same limits and the same power and the same colors, but it. It, I sing differently because I sing, I, I sing knowing where I come from. It's, it's more powerful, it's more passionate, and I'm much more grateful for what I've been given. You know, you, you listen to the, the lyrics and it's true that we're one voice. And, and at the end of the day, we, you know, we, we come together and sing as one. And we hold each other up. And it's, it's so true to Mary's story as well about how how we were able to um, be there for her and even though we couldn't s communicate through English with each other we all had the same voice so we could sing in unison with each other well it goes something like this this is the sound of one voice this is the sound of one voice a song for us that makes a choice. This is a song of one voice. This is a song of one voice.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, as you've been watching tonight, you know we've been talking about cancer and the fact that we're going to try to build, and with your generosity, apparently donations have actually been coming in during Here and Now tonight, which is great to hear, but a new chemotherapy center because cancer is a very significant foe and uh, we'll try to beat it. Now, one person who's had her own journey or battle with cancer is uh, Jen Bishop. So, Jen, tell me a bit about your story. Well, um, I've always been an advocate for uh, cancer care, and I was, it was so amazing to be involved with this video. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my mother passed away at a very early age of cancer, and then in 2012, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. 2017, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer. In 2018, I found out that I had bone cancer. So I come to the cancer clinic very often, at least three to four times a month, and when you walk in through the cancer clinic doors, you see the volume of people in the waiting area, and there are so many that are touched by this disease. And so then the nurse calls you into the chemo unit, and she sa you find one empty chair that's there for you to sit in. And, um, and the, the number of patients that are being diagnosed every year is increasing. And not only that, the people who have um, stage four uh, uncurable cancer like myself there are new treatments for us and we are living longer with cancer so um, well, I always say that tomorrow is never promised to anyone whether you are well or whether you are sick when I was when I was talking to you before we, we, we came on we have to get to that video fairly soon I was amazed at you, you know, what you just said you had a lot of people would go oh my how do you stay positive I stay positive because I have a wonderful circle of friends and I, uh, I have a wonderful family and everyone encircles me with uh, so much positivity and I pass my positivity on to everyone else. I don't think anyone in, in really realizes that someday they may walk through the Bliss Murphy Cancer's doors and be receive their own diagnosis of cancer because I don't think there's one person in Newfoundland and Labrador who hasn't been touched by cancer in some right. way. So we have to join as a community to really support to make this, this a wonderful place and for that, everyone. That positivity that Jen mentions, you can see that uh, in this video. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Take a look.
And you can see that again in this together, nl.ca, this space behind us at the H. Bless Murphy uh, Center, the place where the new chemotherapy center will be built. So check that out and appreciate your attention tonight. And I'll send things back to Debbie. So we're nearing to the end of our program, but you know what we always get to look at? One of uh, Ashley's pictures. Yeah, one of our viewer photos. We'll take a look at that right now. We didn't get a chance to look at it earlier, but look at that beautiful oh, uh, scene that in the is evening. That is gorgeous. It is absolutely beautiful. Uh, there's some identifiers for those who know <laughs> in know. the distance there. Yeah, but it was taken in Lewisport. Beautiful. Yeah. Group of seven painting. It does look like that. <laughs> exactly. Lauren uh, Hiscock sent us that photo. Lovely evening in Lewisport. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if you want to share any wonderful photos just like this one or really anything when you're out and about, send it to uh, nlphotos at cbc.ca because we love seeing them. We were talking earlier in the newsroom, Ashley, about the fact that the buds had all of a sudden popped yeah. with all the rain and, yeah. and the warm temperatures. You could see it in that picture. Absolutely. And this rain today is definitely going to help that. It feels <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Good night.